Hello, everyone. I think we are live. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much for being here today and welcome to today's session. We're going to talk about light on the brain, the science of light and learning in lockdown with Dr. Sally James. I'm Katja Colovea. I will be the moderator of this session today. And I would like to ask you to write on the chat, share where you're based from where you're coming in. Okay, and uh, just before we start with the talk, I would like to share two updates for the upcoming plans of women in lighting. So, number one, we have the International Women's Day on the 8th of March. We are going to have a special global online event where everybody is welcome, and we will be celebrating the second year an anniversary of the project. So, save the date and stay tuned for more information online. And also, on the following months, we will be talking about the first Women in Lighting Awards. And I know that many of you are very interested to know more about it. So again, stay tuned for more information. So just before I introduce and welcome Dr. Sally James on stage, on behalf of Women in Lighting team, we would like to invite you to actively participate in this session as much as possible. Let's make the most out of what we have. I know that we are not here together and we can't see each other, but let's let's and interact by uh, say, uh, writing things on the chat. Actually, there are three ways to, to interact and engage. First, to write your name and uh, where you are coming from on the chat. Second, check the polls. So if you are all uh, on the event side, you can see on the right, you can see event stage and then on the event you can see chat polls people and twitter so write your name and where you're coming from on the chat and then check the polls i don't know i think some of you have already uh, shared with us your answers and most importantly from the beginning please think of the questions that you would like to ask dr sally james okay we are going to have a good amount of time to answer as many questions as possible and if you would like to help us a little bit to spot your question, please, on the comment, write Q&A and then your question. OK, this is going to re be really helpful so we can spot all the questions on the chat throughout the session. OK, so uh, it's time to introduce Dr. Sally James. So Dr. Sally is the founder and managing director of the Age of Light Innovations Group. She has a PhD from the Royal College of Art, speaks fluent French, and is an international expert on light and well-being. Welcome, Dr. Sally James. Welcome on stage. Ta -da, it works. <laughs> Hi. Thank Perfect. you so much Welcome. for the opportunity to be here. Welcome. I'm going to turn off my camera. I'm going to be on the chat. Guys, please write your questions. Write the things that inspire you. We have many, many things to learn from this session today. So yes, let's interact with each other as much as possible and get inspired. Dr. Sally, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. I just uh, had a lighting issue, so uh, there we go. Okay, so what I'd love to share with you today is some thoughts about how we can use light to help particularly young people learn during lockdown. So. Just a little bit about my background and how I came to be so fascinated by this subject. I, I trained in textiles in Paris many, many years ago, and I worked in branding for a number of years, working for international brands using eye tracking and other techniques to, to see how the eye um, notices objects and shapes and colors and light in the world. And um, that was a fascinating career, um, which allowed me to understand, I suppose, the way that the, the brain processes visual information in a way um, that allows you to manipulate behavior. I had a bad head injury myself, which um, forced me to retrain my brain um, and make friends with it in a completely different way. And I realized that I didn't understand how, how this extraordinary system worked, particularly the visual pathway. So that led to um, going back to, to college. I did an MA in printmaking and became fascinated. I became artist in residence at the Bristol Eye Hospital. 
um, which led to work with, uh, I have an ongoing residency, in fact, with the Eye Hospital and with the psychology department at Bristol. But it also led to a PhD from the Royal College of Art um, in Glass, uh, co-supervised by a psychologist uh, and uh, some vision scientists and a ceramicist. And I started to experiment with the optics of glass and using that to trick the brain and to understand how the brain works. Uh, that led to a number of big commissions, including this one, which was at the at the Saatchi Gallery as part of an exhibition called Collect. And um, I wanted to make something where I, the, it was with a mathematician called Roger Penrose, and I wanted to make something where I could change the light and change the colour to express um, uncertainty. And I couldn't find anybody to help me with the lights. It's a, it's a kind of glass which changes colour in different lights. And so I, I found somebody in the end, but I spent so long um, cycling around industrial trading states, I thought, well, I'm going to learn how to do this myself. It's not rocket science. So I took myself back to college and got my city and guilds in electrical um, installations and um, health and safety. Um, and I also got qualifications from the lighting at the LIA in lighting design, which led to a series of uh, a practice which was so exciting, working with artists, performers, scientists to express different um, ways of understanding uh, light uh, in space. So this was a project at the uh, Royal Academy Summer, Summer Ball. Um, and I was just having a ball actually, living in London, uh, Somerset House as one of their makers with a mission to um, help people to understand the power of light and the way it affects our experience of all kinds of things, particularly um, learning and, uh, and well-being. So, um, and then lockdown came and I found myself um, in a very different position and realizing that the young people around me were really struggling with, uh, they were, were kind of we were working on our on kitchen tables um, and decided to do something about that. Um, these are two of my um, inspirations. I'm, I'm lucky enough to know a number of extraordinary young people. This, this is my nieces, Amity and Halo. Um, and I could see them locked down, locked in uh, with, absolutely, and when I talked to them, I realized they had absolutely no idea of the impact of light on their health and happiness and their ability to learn and sleep and uh, and their likelihood of wearing glasses and all kinds of other stuff. So I thought, well, it's really time to um, to share with them some of the new technologies that are out there because it's really not, as I thought before, it's really not rocket science. There's some extraordinary new work that's coming through that means that we can really make a massive difference making very small changes. And that's one of the reasons why I asked you all um, when you were last outside, uh, where where's your window? Those sorts of things, because actually we all get to think about small ways in which light comes into our lives and the way that we use it. So that we are, you might be an architect or a specifier, or you might be a, a mum or a teacher, but really at bottom, you, we are all um, human beings and light is affecting us all in exactly the same way. That led to, um, so I was, I, was, I was here in Bridport um, uh, enjoying, um, a completely different life uh, and I reached out to find anybody I, who would talk to me about uh, light and its impact on the brain and ways that we can do something about it as uh, as concerned um, as concerned human beings not only for ourselves but for other people around us so um, I was lucky enough to have set up a, a series of interviews with some amazingly knowledgeable people both in the area of education and science and lighting itself um, and all kinds of other people started to come forward to um, to express an interest in supporting this kind of initiative, which is to do with raising awareness of the impact of light on the brain. So um, actually, I'm just going to. Yes, yeah, so I'll continue with this now. So out of that conversation came um, the idea of creating a, a program, a public engagement program for children and young young people. And actually, that this is going to provide the. Um, I suppose the structure for this talk, it's part of the inspiration of this talk. Um, you, you guys are the first time that this has um, come out of this uh, small corner of Bridport, other than for my amazing sponsors who have been kind enough to follow the journey along, along with me. So I reached out, we thought, actually, there isn't any information out there. We either have um, manufacturer brochures or you have kind of alarmist stuff on the internet or you have um, teachers who don't really know where to begin. So um, we came, I came up with the idea of creating Luna, who is uh, a trademark young, she, we created a brand and, um, and, her, and, her, and her dad and Beam, her little brother and Spectrum the cat and the fireflies as, as a little family. And we created a series of 
explainer videos, which I'm going to share with you. And they're just today's the first time they've come out and uh, been shared. Um, it's um, yeah, we're very excited by this journey that we're taking together. And I'm really delighted to be sharing this with you today. So, um, yes, as I've begun to put this, uh, these explainers together, um, all kinds of other people have come along to support, to offer their time, to input to the interviews, to review and check material. Um, I'll explain a little bit later on how uh, Amazingly, UCL is going to, there's a, a student who I hope is on the call, um, who is going to help us to understand the impact. So um, it feels like the big journey, but what we're talking about today. So um, what do you need in order to learn? I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. So these kids actually, what you've got is your brain is in a bag. It, it's in an amazing bag. And I knew when I fell off my bike that if we get shaken around, it's not very happy, but it's extraordinary. And it hasn't really got any way of finding out about the world except through some holes at the front and obviously some holes at the side. Um, and that's where light is so powerful because when we're born, we don't know anything about the world. We've got so many different options of how the world might be. And we're using our eyes, we're using sent, um, input from light to understand what's out there. And actually what's extraordinary is that the bits of the brain which process that information, they're right at the back and they're right in the middle. They're right in this section here, the thalamus, the hypothalamus um, and the pituitary gland. So, and the cerebellum, which is predicting what's gonna happen next. So all of the light sensing kit is tucked well out of harm's way. There's no way it's going to get any light other than through these amazing things at the front. What it actually turns out that the the your your eye, the back of your eye is brain tissue. Uh, the retina is is brain tissue, and it behaves that way. And in fact, in early um, space exploration, we use they used the back of astronauts' eyes to understand how the brain was behaving. So um, we get to treat these our peepers with the most immense respect and care because you only get one pair of them, as my mother keeps telling me. Right, uh, I'm going to share my uh, screen again so that I can just continue with the, um, why is that not showing? Application window. Uh, can you see, I knew this would happen, oh, there we are, good. Can you see that now? I'm going to go back to play. So what are the things that, so imagine you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're a mush in a bag and you're trying to work out what's out there to learn. The first thing you need is hardware. You need to be able to actually see out. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the way that light affects the way that the hardware grows. Then you need to know that it's safe because as soon as you, you're in a panic, <coughs> all the other learning and all the other cognitive processes just start shut down and it turns out that flicker manages uh, deals with some of the pathways that are, that are involved with scanning the world out there and um and relaxing or at least managing um the bandwidth the sort of attentional um the, the amount of kind of space you've got in your brain for concentrating the next thing you need to be able to do is to remember stuff. So you might learn something, but um, then you need to remember it. So it turns out that your circadian rhythm and actually light is absolutely vital to your ability to remember stuff. And there's some really extraordinary research coming out about that. The next thing you need to be able to do is to pay attention and the time of day. That's why I asked you what time it was. Uh, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, um, what, what, where you are in the world, because the time of day that it is for you will fundamentally affect the way that you're receiving this information and the way that you remember it. And the last thing which I see in my amazing nieces right now, particularly, is motivation. They are depressed. And there are some things that we can do with light that help them to, um, to care, actually, to not be slumped down in a kind of whatever, because um, we, light, light can help them literally um, trigger a whole cascade of hormones which help them, even in dark times, to feel better. And once we can set that up early, um, those sorts of systems start a, a learn and embedded for life. Okay, so light is the common denominator, but all, all those surprise, surprise, that's why I'm so passionate about it. So I think I did a poll. Now, I, I can't, if I share, I can't see how to do this. So um, 
I asked you guys, how many of you think that if you wear glasses, your kids will too? And um, I don't want to escape this viewing screen. So can you give that some thought? Um, um, Martin or uh, Katia, could you let me know? What do you think? Would one of you be able to jump in and let me know what the poll says? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. It works. So um, you're talking about the glasses, right? Uh, I'm on the yep. polls. Yep. And what time zones are you logging in from? How far away are you from the window? Is there a window where you work? Where do you keep your mobile phone at night? When was the last time you went outside? Um, I can't see this question on ah, okay. the poll, but uh, we can definitely add it. Uh, so okay. people can also, ah, yes, here it is. If you wear glasses, will your kids wear glasses? Okay, so guys, whoever is on the call right now, please go on the polls and uh, provide your answers. This is very, very helpful also to understand, um, oh, yeah, everything about what we are talking today with Dr. Sally James. Yes, I'm gonna yep. turn off my audio now and I'm here for anything that- <laughs> Thank you. So it's essentially what I was surprised by and actually particularly what the kids were surprised by because I've been working with an amazing group of um, young people is that they reckon that if their mum and dad wear glasses, they're kind of doomed too. Well, it turns out actually, no. Um, there are about 97% of young men in Korea right now, in South Korea that need, that need glasses. And it turns out that it isn't because all their mums and dads all need glasses. It's actually a lifestyle issue. The reason is that your eyes, as I mentioned before, they are brain tissue and they are like little plants. And if they don't get enough daylight, they grow the wrong shape. It's very, very simple. Um, we aren't we don't know yet whether um, bright light therapy affects the um, the growth of the eye, but probably not. We know there's something quite special about daylight in the not only the wavelength, the, the kind of visible and the invisible spectrum. So we know that you can reduce if you get kids outside. Um, for there was a wonderful study in in in, uh, in Korea exactly where they got kids outside for um, their break times, which was an additional eighty minutes per day, and the incidence of myopia dropped by forty percent. So it's 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 a, it's a no brainer um, because we know also that myopia is a killer. If you if your eyes stretch, um, the, all the tissue around the eye gets gets to be the wrong shape essentially and as you get older it gets fragile and it starts to break down it also means that there are lots of professions they can't do very easily um, it inhibits sport it's expensive it's a hassle so the first message um we're talking to this focus group they were going well whatever you know they're not that keen they're not that bothered about like about wearing glasses but actually that's something that as adults we get to share with them and we also um i suppose get to do it for ourselves because actually going outside has some other benefits too right i'm just going to share the video oops Oops, sorry. So, oops. So, so what I what what this is the first of the these explainer videos that I've created with the help of a whole bunch of people, um, but also with thanks to the sponsors. So that's the first of our explainer videos. That's the first of the points I want to make. And actually, we've come up to 20 minutes. So what I'd like you to do is to look into a corner of your room because you may not realize it, but you aren't, you don't, you blink only about as half as much when you are looking at a screen as when you are um, looking around the room. So, and as you do that, all kinds of other neurological processes are happening, you're remembering stuff, your brain is locking some things in. So if you can just kind of look across the room while, um, uh, it, Katia, could you just let, let me know what the um, what the poll response was? Absolutely. So, um, what percentage um, is affected by flicker? Okay. Wait. No, 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 no. It's the glasses one. Anyway. Yes, the glasses. So we have for the if you wear if you wear glasses, will your kids wear glasses? So we have twenty six percent saying yes. 
36% uh -huh. saying no, and 38% saying no, don't know. Uh -huh. Have I answered your question? I hope I have. Actually, <laughs> actually, they don't have to. And not only do they not have to, I mean, it depends on the condition, but even if they wear glasses, you can massively, they keep on going to the right team, you can massively affect how that piece of brain tissue grows um, so that they don't get high myopia and they don't risk blindness later on. Have I, I hope I've made the point. Right, let's move on. So um, we know that, um, if you can post that to the, that poll, please, um, Flickr. Uh, one, one of the it's, it, it activates the pathways in the brain which are which are to do with with feeling secure and we know so it actually activates two different pathways one of them is the um, alerting pathway and the other is um, affects your ability to uh, for your eyes to scan the room and it reduces accuracy and speed let me just show you that so essentially when your brain when your brain is under flicker conditions um, that the, the green that the green bits in the middle are the main pieces which which fire up. But you can also see the visual cortex at the back. That's the um, the cerebellum is the kind of cauliflower bit, and the bit above that is the visual cortex. So um, that's your brain under flicker conditions. And it turns out that even if you can't see it, below well at around we know that persistence of vision. So the ability that a movie can run at twenty four frames per second and you think it's sort of a steady movie. We know that at 100 cycles per second, it starts to not be visible. But in fact, the, the brain is still being activated for some people up to 1100 cycles per second. So even at the threshold, which is considered safe, um, lots and lots of people are actually, your, your brain is still getting tired by that, or it's, it's still being activated by that um, and we know that there is a, almost like a sort of an attentional budget so if a lot of your attentional budget is going on um, kind of keeping your eye open for gorillas in the in the woods then um, it's not going to be as available for other stuff the second issue with flicker is as i mentioned before you may not be aware of it but when you're looking around and that's why i asked you to look into a corner of the room as you're looking around your eyes are um, skimming, skimming and sort of hopping and skipping across things and particularly when you're reading text and kids who are learning how to read it's doubly important that the 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 visual field is super stable for them so um, if as the, if you imagine light flickering on and off um, it keeps on it it can't it it's not stable it, it has to keep on doing these regressions and it does many many more regressions and it and it's much much less um, efficient. It turns out that in these um, under flicking conditions, even above 100 cycles per second, with some people, the accuracy drops by up to 20% because the eye sort of overshoots. It kind of can't work out where to go next because the, the, the visual field is not stable. So that's why I was asking how it turns out that a second. Yeah, there we go. So this next one. So how many of you, what, what percentage of the population do you think is affected by Flickr? So, we have, yes, we have 9% uh, of people saying 1%, 18% of people saying 5%, and the majority, with 25 votes, is 74% for the 10%. Uh, yeah, I said many per 10%, many percent, sorry. So, just to, yeah, to sum it up, uh, the majority yeah. of the people thinks that the 10% of the people is affected by Flickr. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, so I don't know how many of you are on there. Maybe maybe there are 20 or 30 of you there. That, that means that, a, a, you know, a substantial number of you there will be suffering from the effects of Flickr. And what's extraordinary is that people and really can't, they aren't able to articulate that, the Flickr as being the issue. They only know when it doesn't happen anymore. So, um, be aware that Flickr is a kind of a hidden problem. And in fact, there is a wonderful, um, a number of different charities, including Light Aware and, um, yeah, particularly Light Aware, who are, on, who are on, a, on a mission to cut out Flickr as much as possible because it really does, for a number of people in the world, it means they can't do normal things like, you know, go into a supermarket because the levels of Flickr are just unbearable for them. So um, this is a little video that we've made. Um, again, the kids went, oh, I didn't, didn't understand. I didn't know that. So um, what was also interesting in the feedback from the kids that they said, well, we we're just children. We, we, we can't do anything about this. And so I guess it's up to us as parents, but also um, 
as, as, as people um, as, as lighting people passionate about lighting is to help them to see that they can make a difference in their own choices. So. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. What did I do then? Can you see that? What have I done? Ah, oh, sorry, I clicked to try and move something. Uh, <sighs> Stop we sharing, let's don't screen, But yes, uh, if you can share your screen again, I guess. I'm sorry about that. Work. Yeah, don't Very worry. Good. Uh, In the meantime, I would like to remind to everyone that uh, please feel free to write your questions on the chat. We are going to have a good amount of time to answer as many questions as possible. Sorry, can you not see it? No. Oh, okay. <sighs> okay, let's start this again. Yes. I'm sorry. We did practice, didn't we, several times? Yeah, it's um, okay. You know, we always have, there's always technolo uh, technology problems. It's okay. Um, if you share your screen on the... Yes, you see that now? Yes, working. yes, yes. We are ready. Good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's go back to Keynote. All right, here we go, play. So... Slide 23, Shelley. There we are, thank you. Okay, let's just, if you can bear to see it again. There we go. So the next one is memory. So you need to have you need to have an environment where you can see stuff and where it's safe to learn or kind of look around. The next thing is is memory. So um, I think there's a little poll. Um, did we do a poll for that one? I think we did. No, the next one's about okay, that's um, fine. children. Let, okay. So essentially, what's interesting is to see that you um, while you sleep, it's actually you learn. For example. If you go, if you get a nap three hours after learning um, some a language, like it's something called a declarative memory, your performance goes up by twenty percent. So you need to choose that. So the the timing of the sleep and the type of the type of memory that you're talking about um, is critically defined by. Um, so the, t the timing of your learning um, and the memory is critically defined by the amount of sleep you get. So what's amazing is that actually while you're asleep, there's more going on than while you're awake, which may not be a surprise to you. We know that the circadian clock, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, there's lots been said about it, but we know that um, the circadian clock, the pacemaker, um, the system which is alert to sunlight is peak sensitivity at about 480. And traditionally, we just focused on that and there are some amazing products out there now which cut out the 480, which is amazing. Um, and the ability to create sort of perfectly tunable light where the, where the um, spectrum is, 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 per is very beautifully balanced is, is really a powerful development in all, in all of this. What we can see though, is that the 480 is part of the picture because the IPRGCs are the, these retinal ganglion cells, which are the ones which were discovered actually only 16 years ago. 
These retinal ganglion cells um, are actually downstream of the rods and cones. So bright light overall affects them. So they're gathering information from the, 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 the rods and cones, which are sensitive to other wavelengths, and then they're putting them all together. And uh, the picture is, is becoming more and more interesting and more and more complex. It turns out there are actually five types of IPRGCs. IPRGCs make up about 1% of the population of the retinal cell. I won't bore you with too much science, but any, essentially, um, we know that that population is highly specialized and seems to be projecting not only to um, the circadian pacemaker, but to some other regions in the brain as well. So um, what's amazing is the way that lighting technology now allows us to, in very simple terms, create lights which don't trigger that melanopic suppression response, um, which is the, the melanopsin is the, is the, um, is the, is the um, hormone which helps us to start to feel sleepy. But um, I guess that's the main message for the kids is, 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 to, is to cut out that cool blue light. But for those of us who are, I suppose, um, passionate about this subject, it's, it's getting more and more interesting and more and more complex. Um, and I think, but for now, the products that are out there, which allow us to um, switch off that signaling pathway at least two hours before bed is 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 going to it could be well should be an absolute lifesaver and that's why i asked you guys whether you keep your telephone near your bed um and um yeah whether you're near a window so let's begin with do you do, um Katia, would you be willing to just check and see yeah. how many people keep so, their so just give me one second um here where do you keep your mobile phone at night and yes the 78 percent of the people, they keep it in their bedroom nearby with 40 votes. And then there is a smaller percentage, 12% in the bedroom over one meter away and in another room at 10 percentage. Wow, five people are keeping it in another room. Yes, tell us, Sally, <laughs> tell us. Ah, that's impressive. I mean, I have to say that I keep mine in my room at the minute, um, but uh, the more I read about it, the more I need to switch it off. It's because in fact, What's interesting is that a little bit of bright light at the wrong time of day, or even a little bit of, yeah, not much light at the wrong time of day has a massive effect. It's like sort of a big bang in a quiet room. Your whole system is settling down for night. And so a small flash of a bright light, particularly in that peak wavelength, is, it's, 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 it's the starter gun. It absolutely gets the whole system going again. So it's really important to find ways of cutting that light out and making sure that it's completely dark. And what those cells and the whole system really need, and particularly these IPRGCs, is contrast. So bright days and dark nights are absolutely key. And we know that if you um, get a good blast of sunlight in the morning, between five in the morning uh, and ten in the morning, according to the specialist I've been speaking to, is is optimal, then you're actually much more um, robust, resili resilient to light after dark. So the main thing is to begin in the morning and set that clock. And then at, at, at night, small amounts of light coming in are not quite so, so harmful. But light from a mobile phone is around 40 lux, which is certainly enough to power up that system. It's like drinking a Red Bull. Well, you wouldn't you wouldn't do that at night. So uh, I think it's time for us to all and, and kids kids do what their parents do. So it's time for us all to to be a little bit more thoughtful about how all this stuff works. So here's a little video that I made about that that we're sharing with kids. Okay, so they need to be able to, yeah, you need to be sleeping. Um, the next thing, is, so we all have this internal clock. The next thing to talk about is um, how our body clock shifts. Um, I think there was another poll. How many of you had teens who struggle to get out of bed? Do we able to ask that one? Yes, 
So we have 34% um, of the people saying yes and 66 saying no uh, with uh, quite equal votes. Uh, I guess also some people might not have kids to, yep. to uh, so uh, yeah. Um, but from those who are, yes, we can see that at least 10 people saying that, yes, they do have teenage children that they struggle to get out of bed. OK, so essentially the point of this little piece is just to say that um, the time of day when you do things makes a massive difference. And teens body clocks are actually two hours later than ours. So um, I think I asked which time zone you're in um, about now you're going to be well, you kind of just over the top of your peak alertness. Um, and if you move into the after, if you want to do some exercise, then doing that later on in the day is, is better. Um, if you harness your body clock and you use light to, to set your body clock correctly, then the your system is so much more efficient. I mean, there are different uh, theories about why, why the circadian clock works the way it does. But the simplest one, you know, is simply that like a conveyor belt, your body, there's no point in having everything running at the same time. It makes a lot of sense to have things running in sequence. And of course, if things try, if, if you get food at the wrong time of day, things that your body isn't ready for it or, and, it and it ends up storing it as fat, there are all sorts of things that happen. So what, if you think about it for a, for your, for a teenager, seven o'clock in the morning wake up is the same as five o'clock in the morning wake up for, for, for us older people. So we, they, they did a wonderful, um, lots of work actually in the States where one state um, changed the start time of school to 9.30 and grades went up, attendance went up, deaths from car accidents went up, the risk taking behavior went down, just some extraordinary, you know, and, and there was great to, because they could have a direct comparison with other places with similar profiles of kids, which didn't do that. So if you're thinking about when you want to achieve to, to do something as, as an older person and with your teens, the main thing is to um, to choose the time of day when you do that. Um, so you can see this, um, this, this little sequence, you can see that their peak alertness is actually rather later than ours. Um, so that's why they're still bouncing about at 11 o'clock at night. So here's a little video. Um, Again, these these topics were chosen in conversation with an amazing group of young people in Bristol and also with, with the young people I know. So um, they were just really interested to know what Body Clock had to do with it all. So here you go. So um, the final topic, I'll just speed through this one, um, is actually that we've talked a lot about darkness and light and switching off and stuff. But actually, one of the things that I've been fascinated by most recently is seasonal affective disorder and um, the impact of light. It's essentially the. Um, yeah, anyway, I'll move through that. Essentially, it's the pair. We've got melatonin, which is the night. And then we've got serotonin, which is our daytime awakening. And I always thought that just getting outside was going to be enough. But what I've done is to download an app on my phone, which allows me to see what the, it's a free app, which allows me to see how many lucks there are outside. And I'm realizing that I'm probably not getting enough living, even, even as I do, I go outside three times a day. Um, so what is really important for teens is for them to to get bright light in the morning but to get enough bright light and it seems as though 2000 lux for an hour is a good baseline and there seems to be a linear relationship and different countries have different attitudes to whether you go for a short sharp burst i mean the americans go for 10000 um and the europeans tend to go for 2 to 3000 lux as as sort of um serotonin triggering um treatment essentially and 
it's really fascinating, really interesting to read what a powerful effect that can have, not only on setting that body clock so that they, um, the, the day night cycle is properly working and so that their brains can rewire in the way they need to but as they shift from being a child to being a grown up, but also so that their attention, their memory, their mood, um, all those things shift really radically without any kind of um, medical intervention, essentially. So it's the simplest, cheapest, most amazing um, therapy you could imagine. And when I was making these videos, I was looking around for good images of bright light in home offices, and I can't find any. It's been really been a struggle. So um, I'm open to images from anybody out there who can. Um, and what's amazing is working with Fogelt and Soul and, um, and Signify, because we're starting to look together at ways that you can you know, help people to understand the way that light in your home can make a massive difference, given that we're working from home so much. But the education sector also um, needs to see how that's shifting. And Fagerholt's done some wonderful work on um, the way that different light levels in different parts of the room will shift behaviour and attention. So um, if you think about the, the 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 pineal and the and I mean the bits of the brain which are dealing with that are right next to each other. In fact. Um, it seems as though sometimes they, they well they certainly project to each other they switch they switch roles often so um bright light is just as important as darkness um and we get to i think it's really important for lighting specialists to remember that and that's why i asked you how far away your you are from your window i realized that i parked my desk quite a long way away because it was sort of more convenient in terms of the layout of the room but when you get to un when you learn a little bit more about how even low levels of light during the day build up to create a kind of a diet of light that's much healthier and much more um, much more um, enlivening, then you start to see how how important it is to to shift the furniture in the room. I spoke to the the team, my um, little um, uh, research group, and they were all said, well, yeah, but, you know, there's a sofa by the window and stuff. I'm thinking, well, um, it's time for us all to to use whatever light there is, as well as bring good quality artificial light into our spaces so that we can be alert when we need to be as well as being asleep when we need to be so here's a, here's a video about that um oh sorry to interrupt i just wanted to say for the polls that uh, it's very interesting that the majority of the people here they say that there is a window where they mm. work uh, 95 percent and also how far away are you from the window uh, the majority of the people, again, uh, they're less than one meter and less than two oh. meters, uh, the second biggest percentage. So it's very positive, the fact that uh, the people that are here are uh, using uh, daylight and their relation to the window uh, for, for uh, yeah, um, well-being. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I'm probably in the minority then. Okay, so in summary, then I'm just going to briefly talk about what's next for Luna and then throw it open for questions. So um, your amazing brain and their amazing brain needs hardware to see out um, and light is absolutely vital to, um, to that. It needs to feel secure um, and flicker is a key modulator of security or that, that experience of security as well as things like glare, but I didn't want to go into that in this little talk because there's enough going on already. Um, so yeah, there are other ways that we can create an atmosphere which feels secure and um, biophilic design. There are lots and lots of things we can talk about, but um, flicker is a key issue in, in um, allowing the brain to focus its attention where it needs to, which is on learning or on social interaction. It needs to be um, dark at night so that you can sleep. It needs to have, it needs to be bright in the day so that you can pay attention and so that you can stay, um, stay, stay feeling like doing something rather than just kind of hanging around in your pajamas all day. 
And that's all to do with the quality of bright light, and particularly in the morning. It seems as though light before 12, a bit like um, yeah, a bit like food before 12, it's digested. It works very differently in the body compared to light in the afternoon. So um, so that that's yeah, it's it's really important that you um Katty, how did we get on with the um who's been outside recently? So here we have, um, when was the last time you went outside? Okay, so um, the biggest percentage, 57% of the people uh, more than four hours ago. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, the, the next biggest percentage is 25%, which is less than an hour ago, which I guess is <laughs> what we're talking about, right? Um, and then there are other uh, smaller percentages for uh, two hours, three hours, four hours, and can remember. Uh, I guess also it depends on the weather conditions and where everyone is located in the world right now, right? Well, it does, except that, I mean, you just download a free app on your phone and you will see that there is, um, you know, a hundredfold increase in the amount of light available in inside a, a corner of a room, a dark corner of a room, or even close to the window, and not hundredfold between a window and outside, but certainly the quality of light. And you're also getting some other kind parts of the visual of the spectrum from being outside that the windows filter out. So um, after I finish going on, uh, I really recommend that everybody get their get their shoes on and get outside because um, and if they've got any young people around them see if they can gather them to go to because that is the one factor that we know is going to change so much in your life um, I'm gonna not going to go on about that too much but you know it, 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 it really matters it really makes a big difference so it also makes a difference the way your your eyes are working because scanning normally in a room there isn't very much space around you and the muscles that direct um, your um, Every part of your brain, actually, but the muscles which direct proprioception. So the way that you um, your coordination, your ability to move around in the world is vitally affected by the amount of time you spend outside just kind of navigating different types of obstacle. So Ray, um, can you please right. share again the name of this app? Because it's super interesting. I think we can all. I mean, so, so the, the, I mean honestly, you, you look online. Uh, the one I've got is called I'm just opening up oh, my phone to switch off. It's called. Um, I think it's called Lux something. It's a free, a free thing. Um, if you look for luck, for light, light meter or Lux meter, uh, there are lots of free ones. I found this one the simplest. Um, okay, it's, so it's a, you, mean to, you mean to check the looks um, uh, around the house and uh, yeah, like, okay. Mm -hmm. But of course, the, the the best thing could be to yeah to go in the window, maybe open the window if you can't go out. Uh, or even better, go out, yes, or in the balcony, or yeah. Uh, absolutely. No, what, the, the reason to, to, to say that is that certainly um, the young people around me, they're quite curious. They want to know why. So if I invite them to go outside and I give them, they, they have an app on their phone and they start to share, oh, isn't, it's, it's brighter here, isn't it? And they understand that br the brighter, the better most of the time. Obviously, you know, you need to kind of worry about glasses and stuff. But if you, um, if they can see how being close to the window, how the numbers go up when you're close to the window, that's pretty motivating. They kind of see what you're going on about. Does that make sense? So, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean then, then do something about it. But the, the, it's it's quite fun to have this. I took I took my take mine on on a, on a walk. There's actually an amazing um, uh, company called Loose who have uh, have a light meter that links to an app on your phone. Um, and they were gracious enough to let me borrow a, well, have a sample. Um, and I've been playing with that and that's fascinating. So, I mean, there are some things, there are some paid for, um, but very, you know, very valuable um, pieces of kit, quite pioneering pieces of kit out there, which allow you to measure your diet of light uh, at different times of the day. Uh, the simplest and cheapest is simply to get a, a free app on your phone. Yeah, so Loose LYS, um, an amazing company based in uh, Copenhagen, I believe. Um, so if you check check them out as well, um, they do some amazing work on measuring light and the diet of light. So I'm just going to briefly just share a little bit more about this and then we'll open up for questions. So um, so since I suppose it was March 22nd when um, I found myself moving out of one life into this really exciting um, project, um, since then, so Fargo Holt, Signify and Soul have been kind enough to support this piece of work and 
a number of researchers and um, we also have, um, I'm not sure if she's on the call, uh, let's, um, so basically the message is it's time to put the humans, including us, at the centre of human centred lighting and we can sort of talk about it as professionals but actually when it comes to it, um, if we don't practice it ourselves then um, nobody else is going to follow either. So what's next? So um, um, we're bringing Luna to life. Today's the first time she's come out of my hard drive uh, to be shared with you all. Um, and we're actually planning a, a press launch um, next week. Um, and I'm going to run a webinar next Thursday um, for anybody who wasn't able to join today, but also um, to follow up on other new information that we have. Um, with the sponsors, we're hosting a Meet the Scientists. So um, a panel of young people are going to ask scientists about light themselves, because after all, it's what really matters is what, what matters to them. Um, so that's on the 25th of February. Um, and then I'm going to be do, doing sort of a weekly focus on LinkedIn um, and other, other social media platforms, um, I suppose, featuring the information in each of the episodes and um, additional learning materials. Some of them are already on YouTube. Next week is all about bright light and mood. And then um, there's a wonderful young research, well, student um Ria who I hope is on the call who has kindly agreed to have a look and see what the impact of um this kind of material could be um in terms of people's engagement with light in the built environment and um Kitty who is another um remarkable young woman um is is, is set up a searchable um database of um scientific, all the scientific papers that I'm drawing on for this and I, I'm always reading something new so um she's kind of set it up on Dropbox so if you'd like to share um ask, um, send, send your email uh, via Martin, or you can send it directly to me, um, then I'll put, then I'll make sure that you, you can be shared in that Dropbox um, resource. Um, and, and, and there are other papers that you feel should be on there, then please, please let me know. But it feels as if um, we need some space for um, the scientific information to be made available so that um and, and research of a good quality to be made available so that um people who are interested in finding out more can do that without relying on um sort of a, a google a google search so looking ahead um firstly is really to enjoy this and to, to see what else the young people need to know about light to help them to be ha happy and healthy um the reason to create a um a family is that we can start to think about um, older people too. So the next one is the next series could be about meeting granny. Uh, we know that, for example, people with uh, older people's eyes grow dimmer. At age 45, you're only getting half as much light in as a 10 year old. Um, so what does that mean for the way that we design light in spaces in our homes? Um, what does that mean for their circadian rhythm? Some interesting work about that going on at the moment. And the other is to do with the environment. Um, had some great conversations with the team in Grenoble about um, light pollution um, and the ways that different new sort of tunable lighting can and, and optics and sensors can can help us to take care of the natural environment and so that's the reason why we have um, a couple of nocturnal animals and, and um, the fireflies and, and spectrum on the team um, to to help us to well help these young people to understand the implications of light and what's possible for them um, in the world so those are my details. Uh, Luna now has her own um, email address. Uh, she's got her own social media account. Um, she's still on my um, Age of Light Innovations um, web page, um, just because she's still only young. Um, but please feel free to get in touch. Um, this is, um, it's, it's a journey that we're all on, but we're absolutely passionate about it. So I shall stop talking. Over to you. Wonderful. Can you hear me? And can you see me as well? Because, uh, yeah, okay, perfect. So first of all, that was fascinating. Uh, it was, yeah, like I, I had this first run with you, but even though so many new information and many things that I feel that I learned from this session and also many notes. So let's start with the questions. Um, okay. We have some first questions about Flickr. I'm going to read the name of the person that is asking and then what they say. And if you want, I can repeat it. So Chiara Amaru Amoruso says, 
is interesting to consider that Flickr perception massively changes according to the context this is experienced. Exposure to light flickering on a dance floor, for example, during a party, provokes excitement. Does this potentially affect the brain in the same way it does when flicker, even imperceptible one, is experienced in a work environment when executing tasks? Okay, so um, if I, I'm just going to rephrase it just to check that I've understood the question. So, as I understand it, and, and, and absolutely, context is all for all of this stuff, actually, whether it be exposure to blue light or flicker. And um, we know that, and it's also to do with sort of a sense of choice. So um, that makes a massive difference too. So I know that um, uh, Nina is on the call and and I mean, so there, there are people with different levels of sensitivity um, to these things. And in a dance floor, actually some people can't go into a dance floor. Um, so, and some people are much more sensitive than others. And some people, uh, you can, it's, it's like sort of peanut allergy, you go, well, what's, what's the problem? But actually uh, we're all on a spectrum. So, so there's, there's this thing about, um, about expectation and agency. If you feel like you can kind of move out of the way, then that's fine. The other thing is to do with um, things which happen at a sort of subliminal level. There's a part, it's like having something in your shoe. It's like, there's something not quite right. So there's there's a there's a if if there's something which is in a peripheral or in, in some set setting which is um subconscious, as in not as in Freud, but as in you know below the what's called the uh, critical quick critical flicker fusion threshold. There you go. Say that with a glass of wine in your hand. Um and below that threshold, we aren't able to actually sort of see. I mean, everyone's threshold is different how tired you are makes a difference how all sorts of other stuff makes a difference so the, so those things so there's something to do with agency there's something to do with actually things which are visible it's like yeah it's flickering it's fine i'm gonna dance things which are like ah, something kind of funny going on here it keeps us on the alert in a very different way does that answer the yeah. question yeah, absolutely. And uh, this uh, also, there's another question from Paulina Villalobos, who says, how much flicker is considered dangerous flicker? Like, do we have metrics or like, yeah, how do you uh, approach that, like in terms of numbers so, or? I mean, there there is a number, which is the kind of standard, but actually more and more research is showing that particularly for people with um different sorts of developmental issues, uh, people on the autistic spectrum, people with ADHD, um, who don't sort of average stuff out in quite the same way, that the sort of standard, which is at 100 hertz, 5%, so 5%, flat. so when you, th there are two bits of this thing. One of them is how often, and the other is how light and dark it gets in between. So how often the standard is around 100 hertz, well, is 100 hertz, so 100 times per second, which is about the same as the power coming down the cables. And the other is, and the other number is how bright, and, and that's five percent. So that between the the top and the next bit down is about is is five percent. But actually, we know that um, for lots of people, that's still a big issue. So uh, there is there is some campaigning to increase that level. Um, but you know, right now, that's that's where that's where we've where we've got to. I, I mean, as I, I mentioned in one of the other um, pieces of video that I've made, um, you don't have. To, oh, it, it's not necessarily being more expensive. It's just to do with the way that things are designed. And there's some beautiful work, some beautiful products coming on the market by all the manufacturers, including people like Ray, um, which are sort of to all intents and purposes flicker free, sort of like 1%. Um, so the other reason why it's sort of more co complicated than that is that um, the bulb, the light bulb is only part of the sequence. So you've got the power coming in, then you've got the switch, and then you've got the transformer. And then you've got the light itself and, you know, the bits in between. So you can introduce a kind of an instability, a flutter in the system in any of those bits. And the problem with an LED is that it goes on and off. There's no there isn't any sort of persistence there. Whereas with an incandescent technology, you, your, your piece of wire can glow on and off. With, you know, it, the, the glowing evens it out, basically. So that's a long answer to, does that, is that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's a very good to, for the, 
to introduce it as well. Um, and here we are following with another question from Gemma uh, Alcala. So she says, uh, this is Gemma from Barcelona. I have always thought that light sources and especially bulbs that are available in common shops do not provide the right information about flicker. Am I wrong? How can we find this information in a simple way? Yeah, that's very, very interesting. You are not wrong. You are absolutely not wrong. And actually, um, Arnold Wilkins, who's been an amazing support on this project, is um, a passionate about it. I've, 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 um, I need to share a link to, uh, he's, he's made a little, he, there's a spinning top that you can make, or a piece of paper you can spin, and it will tell you if your lights are flickering at 5%, but in fact, um, at 100 hertz. But actually, the manufacturers don't have, to, it's not a requirement. Uh, so, my, actually, am I saying that? I'm not sure, it is, don't quote me on that, but not all of them publish that information. So um, um, Arnold's done lots and lots of work with different sorts of, of lamps and um, it, it's not about whether they're more expensive or not. Yeah, some of them are just better than some of them better designed than others. And then obviously there's the sequence of stuff in between. But um, yes, how you can find out actually is to ask the manufacturer. And I think maybe the more of us who ask, the more likely they are to start to go, damn, somebody cares about this. Um, and actually the ones who are good, the ones who make beautiful work, beautiful products and actually invest in that, they will be proud to share it. The people who have something to hide maybe maybe aren't so, aren't so keen. So um, a number of lamps that are you know, perfectly available in, in, in shops are perfectly acceptable from a flicker perspective and others which are more expensive actually aren't. So the only way to do it is to try it, um, see how it feels. And I think, Nino, uh, we had a conversation earlier yesterday, I think it was, you know, it's actually how you feel that that's the main thing and just begin as you would be start to be alert to the taste of a good coffee compared with cheap coffee you know just just get just just get sensitive to how this stuff makes you feel I and mean, you you we probably already are because we're on this call but um invite your children and other people around you go oh isn't can you see the difference and once you start to point out the difference you can really start to feel it and basically and look, it's like raising, raising awareness about it because also a big majority of the people that are in this call, I guess, we have to do something with light. Maybe we're lighting designers or not, or in, just interested on the topic. But like, I think that as we talk more about it and we make people aware that, look, maybe the headache that you have is not because you have a problem. It is because of the light uh, in your environment. So if we start thinking like that and learning with, the videos that you're creating and all the educational material that can be provided, I think we are in a very good direction to, to yeah. yeah. And, what, and what's interesting is that, I mean, talking to the to, to young people, they don't get any of this stuff at school. They they get stuff from an optician if they've got a problem, but none, the, the, none of this, they don't learn about any of this and any of this amazing processing until they're kind of doing A-level or university. I mean, it, it, this should be... The, yeah it, it's it's basic yeah because because this is this is the only you know this is it this thing is mo it's it's in here it doesn't know what's going on until we you know it's so we it's really important to to have kids understand how how this works and um yeah so there's no there's no there aren't any sources of information which is why we're doing this now yeah absolutely and also something that is really really important to say is also the language that we are using because maybe some people you know they see the brain and they say oh this is too too technical for me yeah it's yeah i'm not a i'm not a scientist or a doctor so it's very interesting with the approach of this project to really talk the language of the kids but also the language for us like there are so many things that i know as a lighting designer but i yeah i do have my phone next to me to my bed and the light is going to flash and this is going to interrupt my sleep. So now that I know, yes, I'm, I promise <laughs> that I'm going to be sleeping without the phone next to me. Yeah. Um, let's go to the next uh, topic. There is um, a question about uh, from uh, Laura Arroyo. She, she says, how much truth there is about people being either early birds or night owl, uh, owls? as in how much internal clocks vary within adults of the same age range? Yes, th th there is good evidence that you are, you have a, they call it, it's called a chronotype. Um, and there are some questionnaires. Um, 
I can see in the chat there, Claudia. If 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 we can, we'll set we'll save the chat. And yes, I will I will send um send you the the, the links to the papers. I, I I put together a a list already which I shared with Martin, but I think I'll just add the ones that we refer to today just to make sure that everybody has the information they need. But um. So yes, there, there are some. There's good, robust evidence that some people are naturally morning and an evening people. I happen to be a, an early bird myself, but um, yes, yes, you you are uh, within a range. Um, and I think in the past, um, when when it was more important for you to be kind of locked into the day night cycle. Um, possibly those variations weren't respected as much but now honestly you know you could be up all night or you know this 24-hour thing allows you to sort of to broad to shift your 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 sort of connection with the outside world in, in ways which are um kind of un, un, unusual in evolutionary history um but it, we do know that even if you're within a range getting that punch that kind of set you up breakfast of daylight before 10 even if you're a late night owl is makes such a massive difference. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, okay. So next question is from uh, uh, David Gilby. Um, I, yeah, I, I can agree with that. Isn't it time that the hospitality sector got to grips with jet lag and the resetting of our body clocks with the assistance of artificial light as an international traveler for lighting projects, I would pay extra for this. And yes, I, I also agree. It's interesting. What do you think? So the answer is yes. So, I mean, I think what's interesting is that um, it would be really amazing to have in hotel rooms a sad lamp, which allows you to kind of set your clock properly. Um, and I mean, so the the your eyes are only part of the way that this that there's social there's social signals there's um food and there's um and there's exercise and then there's light so resetting your clock is a combination of those things which is why you know breakfast go outside have a walk um and have a chat you know have a chat to somebody those are the things which allow your body to go oh okay it's time to be up and about and then everything else follows very happily after that and if you are um there's some wonderful work by people like russell foster on uh, and stephen lockley on um sort of phase shift in in shift workers and how that works so i'll gladly share some papers on that but yes i agree there are some very simple things that you could do um that would make a massive difference to people's ability to recover and then work well i mean they're, they're keen to kind of put on big buffets and stuff um but you know actually having having something which is really sensitive to your to to, to resetting that clock would be would be would be a powerful thing to do. It'd be, be really interesting. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah. Somebody so, should uh, should do a case study or yeah, like a university um, project. Okay, so um, okay, there are some questions as well. People are asking. You did mention that asking about reference and research papers uh, about the flicker and safety, and also there is a question from Naina Seldon. Have you been able to do much research on bipolar presentations of a seasonal affective disorder? Um, yeah. The answer is no. Um, but what we do know, um, no, is the, the answer is no. Uh, I mean, there's some really interesting work. The, a guy, um, Timo, who is partner and who was might be has been my partner on the, on that particular part of the project he's done some he's a psychologist um no psychiatrist he's done some lovely work about um about the psychological impact of, of these things and, and i'm sure that if I, I can introduce you nina um i'm sure he'll have some interesting things to say on researchgate there's some really lovely work on that so um glad to share that what we, we do know that um the the the, the clock setting and the mood setting and and all of this, the the cerebellumial prediction is 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 working in very close harmony together. So um, this th there's a there's a very sort of lovely little pathway that goes down th down through here. So um, this is, I mean, if you think about it, we're all sitting here with this thing on the top of us. This <laughs> so we get to sort of remind ourselves that we this is this is what what you're receiving now comes through this. So people with bipolar, um, we know that mood disorders are. I mean, mood you know disorders they're all on the spectrum but you know th this mood this mood regulation happens a lot around here which is very closely linked to this which is linked to the pineal gland so it's all um it's all in a, in a very 
sort of it's all in a, in, in, in a zone of the brain which is talking to each other very very closely so um i'll share if you can add that to the list of things to share i'll gladly show you that yeah absolutely absolutely and uh, martin also mentioned that all those links uh they're going to be shared on the women in lighting link linkedin group uh and this event area so you can all have access on those information and of course uh, we will send you a list with uh, people that are interested to be part of this um, uh, document that you said, the Dropbox document. Yeah. It will be very interesting that we can all uh, have access on uh, resources about the project. Um, okay, so um, I do see, okay, I see a comment here from, yes, from Karen Owens. With a huge increase in screen time now, is there any research on how much time we should be limiting ourselves to spending in front of laptops, phones, etc., on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, the answer is I haven't come across anything which is reliable. I think all of these things say it depends. So um, it's it's obviously sort of a complex equation. And if you are, um, it's so actually I don't know. Uh, we, we there there are some very simple guidelines for kids. Um, which again you can put in the in the in the list of the chat. I, I think it was something like um, half an hour up to age two. Um, it's 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 much less than you think. Um, and what's interesting is to to try um, and use other. So if you're going to switch off two hours before bed, there are you know there are lots you can use this to plan. You can also listen to podcasts. There are all sorts of other ways that you can reduce the amount of blue light exposure that you're getting. Um, so I think if you were to treat your your screen time like um a coffee or like a glass of wine um or like a cream cake you know if you were to sort of manage it so that that was you considered that to be part of a budget um and i think the first thing is just to track it yourself it's interesting you sort of don't realize how long you're spending you kind of hanging around on this for a while and then you you know it's so i think the there isn't anything there aren't any hard and fast rules um there are hard and fast rules for um early development in children and actually for teens there's some interesting sort of regular sort of broad standards for that uh, for grown-ups we're sort of left to our own devices um probably too much uh, the, the the rule of switching off at least two hours before bed is is a no-brainer that's that's the one thing that we we, we, we should be kind of and the, yeah. the rule of yeah. an hour outside a day I the rest I guess we're grown-ups we can do what we like but um we, we know that it's not from a sort of a a brain perspective it's not great because we're um the, the, the kind of the hardware of perception we're just kind of locked at a short distance a lot of the time for the um software of perception we're not getting any of the other sort of three-dimensional cues the, the this system feeds um a pathway here and a pathway here one of them is to do with what stuff is and the other is to do with where stuff is and if it's all on us on a two-dimensional plane um a lot of that um sort of kind of processing and the richness of that processing just isn't isn't sort of it isn't happening you sort of you're living in a two-dimensional world which which isn't as kind of much fun really for this thing <laughs> yes thank you thank you sir yes and also what you mentioned about uh the fact that we are grown-ups as well like and the fact that we also have a connection with lighting and i found myself many times to work in front of the laptop in the dark just before because i i want to be in the dark but i know how uh, tired my eyes are getting and i'm like come on like you can't expect that your friends and your family are gonna uh, be working on the right lighting conditions if you don't do it uh, as a lighting designer you know so yes i think we need to all be a bit more uh conscious about all of those things and it's good that we are here today and talking about all of those topics and raise awareness to us and also be able to raise awareness to our families and our friends. Um, there is another comment from David. Um, in my opinion, the well standard doesn't go far enough with regards to lighting and protecting people's health. What is your opinion? Um, yeah. I think it's better than nothing. I mean, I think that these things are always a sort of a negotiation between commercial interests and, um, the science um, and the very and, and the kind of feasibility. So I completely I completely get it. It should be a kind of a baseline, not something to aspire to. A bit like environmental standards or any other standards you might think of. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. It's to do with um, 
a kind of pragmatic commercial negotiation and a kind of an international trade thing. But I, th I mean, I think that the the good manufacturers are are exceeding those. I think it's just I mean, the, the, the good, many many people are exceeding them. Um, and but it's 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 good to have a stake in the ground. Okay. Yep. Um, I see. Uh, okay. Yes. We don't have much time left. Uh, we do have a few more questions. Um, what's your opinion on blue light glasses? Blue light glasses. So, I mean, I've spoken to lots of people about those because it seems like a super, super easy solution. You know, just put some specs on. I mean, the, the problem is that, um, and yes, obviously better than nothing. And um, I've got a light here, which I can ch change the um, color temperature on and my screens, they change color, but actually, um, it's brightness, as I, as I mentioned before, the the, the IPRGCs are um, sort of, you can think of them like a sort of a, a spider's web hanging a, sort of over 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 a lawn or over grass. So they're like little, um, it's, it's like a very open weave of, of sensors over the top of this, of the, of the rods and cones. So um, they're, they're, they're picking up information. So bright light with blue glasses on is still bright light. So that's not going to work. Um, the other thing that is that we think, oh, it's just blue light on its own, but actually very often the things that we're doing with the blue light, like watching a movie or having an argument with somebody on Facebook, those are things which are also stimulating the other parts of the wake up, mm. kind of that wake up signal. So um, I think blue light, blue glasses are sort of okay, but in a way um, uh, like, um, like sugar-free Coke, it's like, yeah, just don't drink the Coke. Yeah, 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 clear. Um, okay, I think, um, yes, I'm just going to share one more question that uh, came through Saron. Well, not question, but um, mostly it was like a comment. Uh, that's when you were talking about uh, teenagers and sleep and uh, productivity, she did mention that um, her, her uh, kids, they are much more productive because now with COVID, the kids start school two hours after the normal start. So their attention is much better. Uh, but of course, they go to bed later and they get up later and start school later. But she has realized, she realized that the attention of their kids is different. So uh, it's very interesting, you know, during this period to also, yeah, spot those things. Um, yeah. in the, in the it's absolutely fine. I mean, the, their their melatonin starts to kick in at about ten, sort of nine thirty ten. So it's it's eleven o'clock is when they would naturally when they should naturally be going to bed, and they need eight to ten hours. They they need an hour at least an hour more than a, than a ten year old because the, the the bits of the brain which are wired into this executive function, the kind of what are we going to do about stuff, what's things called, what you know, what what making sense of the world. There's a massive shift from connections back here into connections up here and a bunch of other connections just get dropped off because you don't need them so it so they need that time but they need it at the time when their body's ready for it yeah because trying to get them to go to bed when you're ready to go to bed isn't going to work because they're not they're not ready to go to sleep yeah 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 absolutely okay um i see here many comments of, from people saying thank you for all the informative uh yeah for everything that you said super informative interesting knowledge yes um i think also just to say because some people ask this session is recorded so we are going to be uh sharing it so if ever, anyone would like to listen to it again uh it will be possible and of course we will be all uh following your project um um for with luna it's very, very interesting, and I'm sure that we can all support it in uh, different ways and raise awareness about life for the kids. But also, you did mention um, about elderly people and the environment and everything. So it's a long journey, and we will all be here to to support you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'll share the, um, the, 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 the YouTube and those links, and please... The idea of us all, I mean, we're all passionate about this stuff. The idea is to kind of change our own behavior, but also change change, change the world one, one, one young person at a time. So please help us by sharing um, as much as you can in whatever way you can. And come, you know, let me know if there's other stuff that, that would be useful or that you're interested in, because, um, yeah, I'm on a mission to do something about this. So thank you. Wonderful. 
Thank you so much for your time. Thank you everyone for being with us today. And uh, yes, have a wonderful rest of the day. And let's go more it. on to this. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, no, just um, David said, yeah, it's, it's quite good to have, have, have a brain in a box. I mean, this is a, a scientific model, um, an eBay scientific model. Um, so it's, it's worth having one, just to kind of remind yourself who's there. And also um, Nina mentioned about the, um, the light sensors. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, all, they all have their own benefits, I guess. And that's why, and I don't think we need to say we need to go shopping. I mean, this is, this is an amazing thing. So just carry this around with you for a day and just see, see what you do and, um, and see, just share that. It's, it's always, it's really interesting time. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, I just, just before we close the, the session, um, just would like to say a big thank you to everyone again, and let's be more conscious about light in our everyday life. It's like so many tips that we got today and scientifically uh, proven. So yes, let's be all more conscious and share and raise awareness about it.